Aloha. Um, I am Laura McGuire. I'm an architectural historian and professor at UH Manoa in the history of architecture. Um, and I'm hosting today as a part of Nakamomo's summer series on historic architecture in Honolulu and in Hawaii more broadly um, as a subset of the show Humane Architecture, which usually runs during the season. We're doing a little bit of a special series on historic Honolulu architecture. Uh, and today we are going to be looking at a housing development that was completed in the late 1940s through the early 1950s by the famed Honolulu architect Alfred Price. Um, we'll be talking a little bit about that project and I'll be showing you some exciting photos, uh, both historical and uh, contemporary of the housing development. Um, and here to talk with me today are my guests, Brian Strawn and Carla Ciaralta, uh, who are both practicing architects here in Honolulu, um, as well as colleagues of mine at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And we will be discussing not only uh, the creation of the housing project in the late 1940s, but also looking at it in terms of what implications or lessons this particular development might have in terms of solving Honolulu's housing crisis today. Um, so I'd like to welcome you all. Hopefully it will be an interesting discussion um, and probably many jokes will be. <laughs> <laughs> um, but first off, I would like to uh, introduce my guests here. Um, to uh, my left is Brian Strawn. Um, Brian, would you like to say a little bit about yourself? <laughs> yeah, or, not? I, I, I that, or not? I work at the University of Hawaii Community Design Center, um, and I work with students and faculty there mm -hmm. on projects for state agencies and nonprofits around Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Great. And Carla? First of all, thank you for inviting us and for having us oh, on your show thank today. Thank you for See? coming. <laughs> um, I am also an architect. Yeah, you already mentioned that. Um, I uh, essentially teach and also work sometimes at the Community Design Center. And right now, we're currently working on a housing project. So it might be really interesting um, to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, housing. perfect. Yes. Where is the project located? Um, well, we are actually looking at housing as a whole and okay. an affordable housing as okay. a whole here in Honolulu. Okay. Oh. So perfect. Well, but we'll across the whole state. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. And most recently, uh, in my third year studio last semester, we actually worked on the development of a 16-acre unit. Okay. Uh, sorry, 16-acre lot, yeah. um, which is very similar in size to the housing project that we're going to be talking mm -hmm. today. Okay. Great. Great. So I guess um, just to start off, what I thought um, we could do is just to look at some some old photos of the housing development. I'll give a little bit of background, historical background on how it came to be, um, which is actually a really compelling story of community action in and of itself. Um, so if I could actually have the first slide, please. Uh, so this is actually a, um, an article that was published in um, a Honolulu magazine in the 40s, uh, publicizing the project. Um, Veterans Village, or Veterans Village Dreams Come True. Um, basically what was going on in the post-war situation in Honolulu is after the war, uh, an enormous number of veterans were returning from combat, um, some of whom had uh, been Hawaii residents originally, uh, some of whom though were also people who liked Hawaii and just wanted to stay. Uh, and as a result, um, there was an enormous demand for housing um, and really substandard housing conditions for many across the island. Uh, so a group of veterans got together um, under the, uh, the rubric of the American Veterans Committee. Um, and chapter one in particular, uh, under a man named John Akau, who actually became very important uh, in uh, the, uh, promoting the Democratic Party later in the 1950s in Hawaii. Uh, but it was John Akau's idea that if veterans could actually collectively raise money uh, and then get support through the state, um, that they might be able to build housing for themselves. Uh, and this is where the architect Alfred Price comes in. Um, they approached Price, and I'm not really sure how this meeting came about. Uh, Price was a little bit of a socialist. He was interested in community action in general, 
um, probably got hooked up with John Akau through some of these more socialist uh, circles uh, and offered to help them, said, look, you know, I will design a couple of plans for these houses uh, that you guys can then build and execute yourself. Um, so he designed basically two plans for the houses, uh, one a single story design and one a two story design, um, but with the idea that they could be altered or expanded depending on the family's needs. Um, now right at the bottom of the photo you see this big table full of uh, wonderful food and things like that. Um, a part of this development was actually going to be a general store um, and even a general eating facility so that the veterans could all come together um, and have uh, community experiences together. There was also going to be a kindergarten on site, though um, through my research it's unclear whether that kindergarten ever, ever ended up coming into being. So next slide, please. Uh, so here is just this great photo. Um, on the very far left is Alfred Price. Sitting next to him is someone who uh, architectural buffs on the island will recognize, Vladimir Osipov. Uh, Price and Osipov were working together in a firm um, that they had created around this time. Uh, and Osipov was kind of loosely interested in this project, but Price was really the one who was pushing it forward. Um, and what you see here are people um, within this potential community looking over plans, discussing the kinds of things that they might need or want in their houses. The next image, please. Yeah, and here's just another really wonderful photo um, of actually women, uh, housewives, being involved within the design of this community. And I think a really important thing to point out um, for Hawaii in particular uh, is that the ethnic makeup of the Veterans Village complex was, was thoroughly multi-ethnic and multicultural. That was actually one of the goals, and it was one of Price's goals, um, that this would be an integrated community full of veterans uh, from all different walks of life, all different backgrounds, um, with the idea that everyone could live together in, in harmony. Um, whether it completely worked out that way or not, you know, we don't know. But, <laughs> but that was, was definitely the goal. Yeah. So, next slide. Um, so this is the site that was chosen in Palolo Valley. Um, it had been farmland before, um, and part of the way that Price and the veterans got a hold of this land um, is that it was actually, and we'll talk about this later, um, relatively low cost. Uh, it was agricultural land that wasn't being used, um, and the person who owned it, uh, sympathizing with the plight of veterans, many of whom were homeless at the time, uh, was actually willing to virtually donate the land uh, at a very low cost. Um, so land always being one of the most expensive things on the island, the veterans got a real deal here. Uh, next slide. Uh, and this is what happened. Um, a development of really lovely, um, in many cases, two and one story houses uh, situated along the riverbed. There were some problems with that later um, in terms of flooding, <laughs> um, but that ended up uh, being solved through uh, barricades and barriers being uh, placed through the stream <laughs> area. Uh, yeah, but wooden houses very simply built um, and actually also expressing a fair number of, of modernist styles. Price was a modernist architect. So you see these wide expanses of windows, a lot of uh, horizontal kind of orientation. Next slide. Uh, and this is just a curbside shot. Um, and you'll notice in, if you like squint your eyes and look at the text, uh, it says here the homes are shown uh, those by uh, Yasunori Kano, George Miyashiro, Herbert Pang, uh, Yoshido Fukuyama, uh, and Flint. Yonashar expressing really the, the multi-ethnic makeup of this community. Slide. Um, and here's just some um, examples of the, the one-story house 
versus the, the two-story house. And one of the things that I always notice about the house on the right is, in a way, it has this sort of Frank Lloyd Wright quality to it with those wide overhanging mm -hmm. things. And Carla and Brian are actually from Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> there's a little um, bit of connection. So there's a little bit of connection there. Um, it probably looks a little bit familiar to you um, yes, it does. In, in a variety of ways. Do you know how many of these two-story Houses versus the one story? Yeah, like, what is the makeup of that? That's the... a good question. I actually haven't gone out and done a count. Um, mm -hmm. The one story houses were more prevalent, um, mainly mm -hmm. because they were cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, so the way this worked was veterans uh, were getting loans for the building of their houses, but not individually. Um, the loans were administered through the American Veterans Committee. Mm -hmm. uh, so it really was a collective organization. Um, and veterans who were interested in this development could pay in a certain amount towards this collective mortgage. Mm -hmm. um, so they weren't being asked to finance these things completely on their own. Um, there was also a lot of money available through the federal government um, in terms of uh, giving veterans a certain amount of money towards the construction mm -hmm. of their houses. Mm -hmm. um, so there was really a lot of investment uh, both at uh, you know, the community level but also at the federal level mm -hmm. at this time, which is something I think we're lacking mm -hmm. now. You know, I mean, the federal government had, a, had an interest in making sure that veterans weren't homeless mm -hmm. um, given that they had just won World War II. Uh, for the United States, um, and unfortunately, today what we're looking at is a housing crisis for a much broader swath of the population. Yeah. Um, you know, veterans are in some ways getting uh, decent services here on the island, but but everyone else is not. Yeah, yeah. So it's a it's a complex question. Yeah. So next slide. This is just another one of the single family houses. I have a bunch of images of these. We can move on um, and actually just scroll through a couple of the, these are the color images. And this is actually one of the best preserved houses. Um, it's on Ua Drive in Palolo Valley. Um, this is probably the house that is most like what Price origi originally designed. It's had the fewest alterations. Um, so we have these uh, nice kind of lathe uh, screens, um, lots of little details, both in color uh, and in trim, but the houses themselves are very, very low cost. So not a lot of money is being spent, but Price was trying to design in um, detail and I, if ornamentation, if you will, I think through the use of very prosaic and kind of plebeian materials to make these really livable. And they all have a broad overhang mm -hmm. and sun, some sun shading, it yes. looks like. Yeah, absolutely. So those overhanging mm -hmm. eaves, um, definitely always something that's important in a tropical climate mm -hmm. uh, to keep them shady inside. And potential for natural ventilation. Yes. So um, protect yourselves from, from the sun and allow the wind through mm -hmm. and also up off the ground. Yes. Um, Yes, that too. Um, yeah, so um, the, they're actually all raised off the ground. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, um, I haven't completely figured that out yet, but for one, I think it has to do with, with insects mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, coming in. Mm -hmm. um, but also because the Palolo stream is so nearby, mm -hmm. um, if there is flooding, the houses can be elevated mm -hmm. and, and protected. Yeah. The next image. Yeah, and this is a shot of the same house. So lots mm -hmm. of window space, uh, lots of potentially natural ventilation, although lots of people have put in air conditioning. I see that in the window. <laughs> do you know how big, do you know how big the, how many bedrooms uh, some of these had? Yeah, so most of them have three bedrooms. Mm -hmm. um, they were really designed for families. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, a, the ideal being the nuclear family, so a mm -hmm. mother, a father, and one to two children. Mm -hmm. um, some of the two-story examples do have four bedrooms. Um, mm -hmm. And in some cases, the mm -hmm. veterans who built them, because they were allowed to change the plans, actually added bedrooms 
on the ground story. Rather than just having um, the building raised, mm -hmm. uh, they finish the basement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there's just a lot of flexibility built in. Price made the plans, but then said, do what you want with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Next image. Just another little detail shot. The color. And I think the next image. Yeah, you can see those wide eaves for ventilation. And next image. And this is just one of my favorite <laughs> favorite parts. Really great detail. Great detail. Yeah, yeah. I mean, using um, very economical materials, but doing it in such a way to give it some aesthetic content. Was there a um, community association that was set up to, or I mean, traditionally today we think of it as like paint colors and deciding what kind of mailbox you can have. As far as I know, um, there was a community association, mm -hmm. but I don't think they dictated details like that. Mm -hmm. um, people seem to, if you go walk around the, the Veterans Village now, mm -hmm. um, I mean, so many alterations have been made at this mm -hmm. point. Um, but I think people were actually really allowed to do whatever they wanted in terms of decorative mm -hmm. trim. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that Price would have preferred that everything stayed <laughs> yes. the way that he designed it. Probably. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, you know, he kind of was willing to be fairly hands-off uh, afterwards, you know. Unlike someone like Frank Lloyd Wright, who, <laughs> <laughs> who, who micromanaged You won't spaces. have total control. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so next slide. Yeah, and then just that nice sort of lathing for screen. And a lot of people have actually removed that mm. from the houses now. Many people have actually enclosed these areas oh. to make another, another room, mm -hmm. essentially. Um, but the idea being here that, you know, it's a place to put your shoes and to kind of get out of the weather and maybe be a little bit outside, uh, even still when you're partly inside. It was um, nice because it would give you a little bit of privacy too when yeah. you're arriving or leaving, or just to keep your door, front door open if you wanted to. Yeah. Without it's a threshold, and it so is. it was the importance of the threshold. It is. We were talking on the way over about um, learnings from this for today mm -hmm. for any housing development in Hawaii, and I think one of the things that we were talking mm -hmm. about was how low density uh -huh. this was, even though yeah. they appear right. in photo to be rather close to one another. Uh -huh. It's much more spread out than you would it get is. today. It is, absolutely. So the, yeah. these sort of privacy screens that you see at the front, um, sort of blocking the view into the front mm -hmm. door from neighbors, mm -hmm. those are the sorts of things we were hearing from um, the people that we talked to in the community really? about what they wanted in their housing. Because they do want a threshold, yeah. Yeah. but every time there's available space, it gets enclosed and turned into interior space. Okay. So I, I think that's one of the... Yeah, so some of the communities that exist today that, we, that we've talked to are mm -hmm. very similar in, mm -hmm. in terms of density. So for example, for 16 acres, there's about 221 units, which would be the equivalent to like 94 units, maybe uh -huh. for 14 acres, which is what this development is like. Yeah. Um, and that privacy is really important. So this would be an example of how to design a screen, yeah. for example, for that privacy. And always to have like access to the outdoors too, not only, mm -hmm. not only just have the door right away, right yes. in front of the sidewalk. Yeah, and there <laughs> or are the some, car. Yeah, or the car. Or the right. car. Right. And there some, are some examples, and we can just go through some of these images really quickly mm -hmm. so we can actually get to the, um, get to the more <laughs> contemporary <laughs> substance part of the discussion. These are the interiors, you know, really low cost, very simple. But the built-ins are what yeah. we were hearing from uh, residents, what they actually wanted in homes. Okay. So when they were moving in between units over the course of their lifetime, mm -hmm. they didn't have to move big furniture. furniture. So the value of the built-ins that are in this particular image, yes. um, I think are really interesting uh, yeah. for current context as well as in and 1940. And then you don't, have, yeah. you don't have to buy all that stuff, so mm -hmm. it actually is more sustainable too because then mm -hmm. you can mm -hmm. use it and reuse it no mm -hmm. matter who moves into it. So that's some of the value that design can bring. And that's very simply yeah. detailed, made of nominal lumber. It doesn't have to be fancy, uh -huh. which is what this image is showing, mm -hmm. but nicely designed. Yeah, and, and you know, that's actually something, um, and this is getting all architectural history, but that's, <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is something that, you know, an idea that Price actually kind of imported from Vienna because he grew mm -hmm. up in Vienna and was trained in uh -huh. Vienna, which was, at least when he was trained in the 20s and 30s, the land of built-ins. 
Mm -hmm. um, everyone was going gaga over built-in mm -hmm. furniture, um, and he was able to kind of translate that uh, huh. into a Hawaii context and also to a low-cost mm -hmm. development kind of context. Yeah. Next image. Yeah, so lots of good cabinetry, lots of good storage space. I think having a house uh, for people mm -hmm. where everything is laid out um, in a way that makes it very usable um, is, is, is a good thing. That's a roomy kitchen. It is a roomy kitchen. For 1940s especially. Yes, But it it's is. also giving you an opportunity. It's kind of like an, what we call today open plan yeah. a little bit because it's yeah. giving you the opportunity not only to look out and not blocking the view to look outside while you're doing the dishes mm -hmm. or cooking, but also an opportunity to have a big table, which I'm guessing I, I think is there they do. maybe in the image. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So that you can have dining and have cooking at the same time, yeah. which is really like a modern idea. Yeah. A very modern idea. Yeah, and it was really not until the 1940s that people, at least in the United States, started to develop that idea of the open kitchen. Mm -hmm. So um, price is kind of on the cutting edge mm -hmm. uh, in mm -hmm. a project like this. And then bringing what's kind of avant-garde, mm -hmm. in a way, uh, to this low-cost housing mm -hmm. development. And those are stainless steel countertops, which are... Is that I, correct? I don't know I think they if are. those original? are original, actually. I'm they not could entirely be. sure, but I'm, I'm guessing they probably are. They could be. Yeah, I think they could be. It looks like Hawaii kitchen supply. Yes. <laughs> we have those in our unit now Do from you? the 1960s, yes. yes. Wow, wow. But it, it is a really great kitchen. And, so. I, and I just want to point one thing out yeah. because I know another image is coming up, but the, the cabinet, the kitchen cabinetry, matches around around the house if mm -hmm. i'm not wrong yeah and i think that that's also really nice so we'll mm -hmm. see it i guess next yeah the so next image yeah and there you go this is the the bathroom the toilet paper image um but i just wanted to highlight you know like these lovely drawers you know everything being built in um nice kind of bringing in a pop of color through that formica and through that tile so making these really livable, um, aesthetically pleasing spaces, but for not much money. That's probably not the original toilet paper holder. Probably not. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm guessing that was new. It doesn't it's, match. doesn't match. Yeah. Yeah. But next image. Yeah. So um, this is actually one of the larger examples. Um, but it's still, again, you know, as you pointed out, using that screen as the mm -hmm. threshold. Uh, and then doing that really nice angular little railing as a detail. So just throwing in these little details to kind of enliven the house um, in what would be otherwise a kind of prosaic sort of building. So I guess now, I mean, it would be good, I think, since we've seen a little bit of these, just to kind of turn the discussion over to, to what this might teach us about our contemporary situation. And I'd like to hear some of the, the work that you guys have been doing, um, particularly your opinions on how this kind of community design, with architects helping, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. that was a key catalyst here, mm -hmm. um, which realized Definitely. a really wonderful project, um, how that's going <laughs> for you. <laughs> I think like some of the learnings that we can take from this particular project that we can still apply today, maybe we can... <clears throat> start there, mm -hmm. um, we were discussing, for example, the idea that the user is involved. Mm -hmm. So these families are talking to the architect directly and the table, you know, they're having mm -hmm. discussions, they're telling him what they want, what they need, yeah. and so he can take those learnings and bring them directly into the design. Um, also that the, them being a community uh, and thinking about all these amenities. Mm -hmm. um, probably we're, th we're, we're thinking a lot about what the ideal community would be. Mm -hmm. and we're, brainstorming, I guess, on that. Mm -hmm. And we've been talking a lot about sustainability, we've been talking about walkability, mm -hmm. and we've been talking about equity. And mm -hmm. I think in terms of like having amenities around you, it makes for a walkable community, potentially. Mm -hmm. um, I hear there was a daycare yes. uh, plan and yeah. maybe a park. Yeah. And I think you mentioned something else. I forget yeah, what it was. A, a basically a, a grocery store. So that yeah. would be ideal. So then yeah. you can, in not that long, you can just go out and walk and get what you mm -hmm. need. Um, so. I think, those are very I think the important. idea of the walkable community is one of the things that we're extremely interested in today. And mm -hmm. I think the density that 
was appropriate in 1940, mm -hmm. which is approximately how many, was it? 72 years ago. Yeah. 72 years ago. Yeah. Um, at <laughs> 86 houses, that? that's, that's like, crazy. Uh, oh, gosh. <laughs> 86 houses on 14 and a half acres, yeah. which um, today might support um, in a mixed use sort of, um, there's this phrase, um, high density, low rise mm -hmm. idea for walkable communities, if they can have a grocery store, mm -hmm. if yes. they're adjacent to a school as well, yeah. um, and a restaurant, if you're lucky, or yeah. a, a small store where you can pick up. Um, just odds and ends every day, they can support more like a thousand or two thousand units okay. on that same size. Okay. And that's what we're looking at, I think, to yes. try to figure out with the rail coming in mm -hmm. on these sort of transit oriented developments mm -hmm. with larger parcels that um, the city owns or Hawaii Public Housing Authority owns that they can be developed to a greater density and yeah. still be really great places to live. Yeah. So we're looking at this idea of 20 minute living. Yeah. Where can you walk within 20 minutes? Or if you have to hop into a car, right. can that be a really short trip in the car mm -hmm. and reduce overall number of car trips, which helps with traffic mm -hmm. problems, which we get to enjoy in Hawaii yeah. along with the weather. Um, but also it improves health because you walk uh -huh. more, yes. you're not in the car all the time. Yeah. Uh, not only physical health, but also mental health. Mm -hmm. you, get, you, know, you get outside and, and it's just more livable. Do you think in terms of, um, and I realize we're, we're almost out of time, but do you think in terms of just the financial aspect, um, this was a situation in which a community organization essentially was responsible for obtaining the mortgage um, or the bigger mortgage for the development um, through individual buy-ins by veterans themselves. Is that a model that could possibly work today or is that just are those I think days that, that, gone? that financing <laughs> model is very, um, made, might have been cutting edge at the time. And I know in mm -hmm. Chicago they were trying to do that in the 50s and 60s yeah. as well. So varying levels of success. I think today that is not enough yeah. to make one of these projects happen. Yeah. Public private partnerships are a necessity. Yeah. Um, they're over a billion dollars, these sort of developments that can support low rise, high density living um, in the city where people want to live near work and near their schools. So those sort of economic models are not quite as sophisticated as the ones we need today <laughs> yeah. to pull off these sorts of projects. I think you need a whole show to talk about. I know. <laughs> we should do another that. one. Yeah. But, but <laughs> I, would, I would like just to say that what is important is that to understand that design mm -hmm. uh, is for everybody and mm -hmm. it, it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be fancy, yeah. um, but it could be for, for all, all different types of housing. Mm -hmm. Box of life. Well, thank you so much for, for coming with this was just much too short. I always feel like we could have so, so much more to talk about. Um, but uh, thank you for joining us. This was, a, I think, a really interesting discussion. Got to look at some interesting buildings, have a little bit of conversation about um, what housing needs to be here on the islands uh, now and, and hopefully in the future. And I, I do think it's always important to kind of go back to history sometimes to see what we can do in the future. So thank you very much for joining us.